Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, Chapter 2, In Memoriam Harry was bleeding, clutching his right hand in his left, swearing under his breath. He shouldered open his bedroom door. There was a crunch of break in China. He had trodden on, on a cup of cold tea that had been sitting on the floor outside his bedroom door. What the... He looked around. The landing of number four Privet Drive was deserted. Possibly the cup of tea was Dudley's idea of a clever booby trap. Keeping his bleeding hand elevated, Harry scraped the fragments of cup together with the other hand and threw them into the already crammed bin just visible inside his bedroom door. Then he tramped across to the bedroom, uh, to the bathroom, to run his finger under the tap. It was stupid, pointless, irritating, beyond belief. That he still had four days left of being unable to perform magic. But he had to admit to himself that this jagged cut in his finger would have defeated him. He had never learned how to repair wounds, and now he came to think of it, particularly in light of his immediate plans, this seemed a serious flaw in his magical education. Making a mental note to ask Hermione how it was done, he used a large wad of toilet paper to mop up as much of the tea as he could before returning to his bedroom and slamming the door behind him. Harry spent the morning completely emptying his school trunk for the first time since he packed it six years ago. At the start of the intervening school years, he had merely skimmed off the topmost three quarters of the contents and replaced or updated them leaving a layer of general debris at the bottom. Old quills, desiccated beetle eyes, single socks that no longer fitted. Minutes previously, Harry had plunged his hand into his mulch, into this mulch, experienced a stabbing pain in the forefinger of his right hand and withdrawn it to see a lot of blood He, he now proceeded a little more cautiously. Kneeling down beside the trunk again, he groped around in the bottom, and after retrieving an old badge that flickered feebly between support Cedric Diggory and Potter Stinks, a cracked and worn-out sneaker scope, and a gold locket inside which a note signed R.A.B. had been hidden, he finally discovered the sharp edge that had done the damage. He recognised it at once. It was a two-inch long fragment of the enchanted mirror that his dead godfather Sirius had given him. He laid it inside and felt cautiously around the trunk for the rest, but nothing more remained of his godfather's last gift except powdered glass, which clung to the deepest layer of debris like glittering grit. Harry sat up and examined the jagged piece on which he had cut himself, seeing nothing but his own bright green eye reflected back at him. Then he placed a fragment on top of that morning's daily profit, which lay unread on the bed, and attempted to stem the sudden upsurge of bitter memories, the stabs of regret and of longing the discovery of the broken mirror had occasioned by attacking the rest of the rubbish in the trunk. It looked another, it took another hour to empty it completely, throw away the useless items and the sort, and sort the remainder in piles according to whether or not he would need them from now on. His school and quidditch robes, cauldron, parchment, quills, and most of his textbooks were piled in a corner. To be left behind. He wondered what his aunt and uncle would do with them. Burn them in the dead of night, probably as if they were the evidence of some dreadful crime. 
his muggle clothing, invisibility cloak, potion making kit, certain books the photograph album Hagrid's had once given him, a stack of letters and his wand have been repacked in an old rucksack. In a front pocket were the Marauder's map and the locket with the no signed RAB inside it. The locket was accorded yeah, the locket was accorded this place of honour, not because it was valuable, in all usual senses it was worthless, but because of what it had cost him to attain it had cost to attain it. This left a sizable stack of newspapers sitting on his desk beside his snowy owl headwig, one for, one for each of the days Harry had spent at Privet Drive this summer. He got up off the floor, stretched and moved across to his desk. Hedwig made no movement as he began to flick through the newspapers, throwing them on the rubbish pile one by one. The owl was asleep, or else faking. She was angry with Harry about the limited amount of time she was allowed out of her cage at the moment. As he neared the bottom of the pile of newspapers, Harry slowed down searching for one particular edition, which he knew had arrived shortly after he had returned to Privet Drive for the summer. He remembered that there had been a small mention on the front about the resignation of Charity Burbage, the Muggle Studies teacher at Hogwarts. At last he found it, turning to page 10, he sank into his desk chair and reread the article he had been looking for. Albus Dumbledore Remembered by Alpheus Doge I met Albus Dumbledore at the age of eleven on our first day at Hogwarts. Our mutual attraction was undoubtedly due to the fact that we both felt ourselves to be outsiders. I had contracted Dragonpox shortly before arriving at school, and while I was no longer contagious, my pockmarked visage and greenish hue did not encourage any to approach me. For his part, Albus had arrived at Hogwarts under the burden of unwanted notoriety. Scarcely a year previously, his father Percival had been convicted of a savage and well-publicised attack on three young muggles. Albus never attempted to deny that his father, who was to die in Azkaban, had committed this crime. On the contrary, when I plucked up the courage to ask him, he assured me that he knew his father to be guilty. Beyond that, Dumbledore refused to speak of the sad business, though many attempted to make him do so. Some indeed were disposed to praise his father's action and assured that Albus too was a muggle hater. That could not have been more mi they could have been they could not have they could not have been more mistaken as anybody who knew Albus would attest he never revealed the remotest anti muggle tendency. Indeed his determined support for muggle rights gained him many enemies in subsequent years. In a matter of months, however, Albus's own fame had begun to eclipse that of his father. By the end of his first year, he would never again be known as the son of a muggle-hater, but as nothing more or less than the most brilliant student ever seen at the school. Those of us who were privileged to be his friends benefited from his example, not to mention his help and encouragement, with which he was always generous. He confessed to me in later life, that he knew even then that his greatest pleasure lay in teaching. He not only won every prize of note that the school offered, he was soon in regular correspondence with the most notable magical names of the day, including Nicholas Flamel, the celebrated alchemist, Bethilda Bagshot, the noted historian, and the Dolbert Waffling, the magical theoretician, 
Several of his papers found their way into learned publications such as Transfiguration Today, Challenges in Charming, and The Practical Potioneer. Dumbledore's future career seemed likely to be meteoric, and the only question that remained was when he would become Minister for Magic. Though it was often predicted in later years that he was on the point of taking the job, however, he never had ministerial ambitions. Three years after we had started at Hogwarts, Albus's brother Aberforth arrived at school. They were not alike. Aberforth was never bookish, and unlike Albus, preferred to settle arguments by duelling rather than through a short dis reasoned discussion. However, it was. However, it is quite wrong to suggest, as some have, that the brothers were not friends. They rubbed along as comfortably as two such different boys could do. In fairness to Aberforth, it must be admitted that living in Albus's shadow cannot have been an altogether comfortable experience. Being continually outshone was an occupational hazard of being his friend and cannot have been any more pleasurable as a brother. When Albus and I left Hogwarts, we intended to take the then traditional tour of the world together, visiting and observing foreign wizards before pursuing our separate careers. However, tragedy intervened. On the very eve of our trip, Albus's mother Kendra died, leaving Albus the head of the, the head and sole breadwinner of the family. I postponed my departure long enough to pay my respects to Ke at Kendra's funeral, then left for what was now to be a solitary journey, with a younger brother and sister to care for, and little gold left to them. There could no longer be any question of Albus accompanying me. That was the period of our lives when we had least contact. I wrote to Albus, describing perhaps insensitively the wonders of my journey from narrow escapes from chimeras in Greece to the experiments of the Egyptian alchemists. His letters told me little of his day-to-day -day life, which I guessed was to be frustratingly dull for such a brilliant wizard. Immersed in my own experiences, it was with honour, with horror, that I heard towards the end of my year's travels, that yet another tragedy had struck the Dumbledores, the death of his sister, Ariana. Though Ariana had been in poor health for a long time, the blow coming soon after the loss of their mother had a profound effect on both of her brothers. All those closest to Albus, and I count myself one of that lucky number, agree that Ariana's death was Albus's feeling of personal responsibility and Albus's feeling of personal responsibility for it, though of course he was guiltless, left their mark upon him forevermore. I returned home to find a young man who had experienced a much older person's suffering. Albus was more reserved than before, and much less light hearted. To add to his misery, the loss of Ariana had led not to a renewed closeness between Albus and Aberforth, but to an estrangement. In time, this would lift in later years. They re-established, if not a close relationship, then certainly a cordial one. However, he rarely spoke of his parents or of Ariana from then on, and his friends learned not to mention them. Other quills will describe the triumphs of the following years, Dumbledore's innumerable contributions to the store of wizarding knowledge, including his discovery of the twelve uses of dragon blood, uh, dragon's blood will benefit generations to come, as will the wisdom he displayed in the many judgments he made while chief warlock of the wizard came up. They say still that no wizarding duel ever matched that between Dumbledore and Grindel Grindelwald in 1945. Those who witnessed it have written 
of the terror and the awe they felt as they watched these two extraordinary wizards do battle. Dumbledore's triumph and its consequences for the wizarding world are considered a turning point in magical history. To match the introduction of the international statute of secrecy or the downfall of he who must not be named, Albus Dumbledore was never proud or vain. He could find something to value in anyone, however apparently insignificant or wretched, and I believe that his early losses endowed him with great humanity and sympathy. I shall miss his friendship more than I can say, but my loss is as nothing compared to the wisdom worlds. That he was a most inspiring and the best loved of all Hogwarts headmasters cannot be in question. He died as he lived, working always for the greater good, and to his last hour as willing to stretch out a hand to a small boy with dragon pox, as he was on the day I met that I met him. Harry finished reading, but continued to gaze at the picture accompanying the obituary. Dumbledore was wearing his familiar kindly smile, but as he peered over the top of his half-moon spectacles, he gave the impression even in newsprint of X-raying Harry, whose sadness mingled with a sense of humiliation. He had thought he knew Dumbledore quite well, but ever since reading his obituary, at this obituary, he had been forced to recognise that he had barely known him at all. Never once had he imagined Dumbledore's childhood or youth. It was as though he had sprung into being as Harry had known him, venerable and silver-haired and old. The idea of a teenage Dumbledore was simply odd, like trying to imagine a stupid Hermione or a friendly blast-ended screw. <laughs> he had never thought to ask Dumbledore about his past. No doubt it would have felt strange, impertinent even, but after all, it had been common knowledge that Dumbledore had taken part in that legendary duel with Grindelwald and, ha Grindelwald, and Harry had not thought to ask Dumbledore what that had been like, nor about any of his other famous achievements. No, they had always been discussed. Harry. They had always discussed Harry. Harry's past, Harry's future, Harry's plans. And it seemed to Harry now, despite the fact that his future was so dangerous and so uncertain, that he had missed irreplaceable opportunities when he had failed to ask Dumbledore more about himself, even though the only personal question he had ever asked his headmaster was also the only one he suspected that Dumbledore had not answered honestly. What do you see when you look in the mirror? I? I see myself holding a pair of thick woolen socks. After several minutes, thought Harry, several minutes thought, Harry tore the obituary out of the daily, uh, out of the profit, folded it carefully and tucked it inside the first volume of practical defensive magic and its use against dark arts. Then he threw the rest of the newspaper onto, uh, onto the rubbish pile and turned to face the room. It was much tidier. The only things left out of place were today's daily profit, still lying on the bed, and on top of it, the piece of broken mirror. Harry moved across the room, slid the mirror fragment off today's profit and unfolded the newspaper. He had merely glanced at the headline when he had taken the rolled up paper from the delivery owl early that morning and thrown it aside. After noticing that it said nothing about Voldemort, Harry was sure that the Ministry was leaning on the Prophet to suppress news about Voldemort. It was only now, therefore, that he saw what he had missed. Across the bottom half of the front page, a smaller headline was set over a picture of Dumbledore striding along, looking harried. Dumbledore, the truth at last. 
Coming next week, the shocking story of the flawed genius considered by many to be the greatest wizard of his generation. Stripping away the popular image of serene, silver, bearded wisdom, Rita Skeeter reveals the disturbed childhood, the lawless youth, the lifelong fens of the guilty and the guilty secrets that Dumbledore carried to his grave. Why was the man tipped to be Minister for Magic, content to remain a mere headmaster? What? was the real purpose of the secret organization known as the Order of the Phoenix. How did Dumbledore really meet his end? The answers to these and many more questions are explained in the exclusive new biography, The Life and Lives of Albus Dumbledore by Rita Skeeter, exclusively interviewed by Betty Braithwaite, page 13 inside. Harry ripped open the paper and found page 13. The article was topped with a picture showing another familiar face, a woman wearing jeweled glasses with elaborately curled blonde hair, her teeth bared in what was clearly supposed to be a winning smile, wiggling her fingers up at him, doing his best to ignore this nauseating image Harry read on. In person, Rita Skeeter is much warmer and safer than her famously ferocious quill portraits, her portraits might suggest. Greeting me in the hallway of her cosy home, she leads me straight into the kitchen for a cup of tea, a slice of pound cake, and it goes without saying a steaming vat of freshest gossip. Well, of course, Dumbledore is a biographer's dream, says Skeeter. Such a long, full life, I'm sure my book will be the first of very, very many. Skeeter was certainly quick off the mark. Her 900-page book was completed a mere four weeks after Dumbledore's mysterious death in June. I ask her how she managed this super-fast feat. Oh, when you've been a journalist as long as I have, working to a deadline is second nature. I knew that the wizarding world was clamouring for the full story, and what I and I wanted to be the first to meet that need. I mentioned the recent widely publicised remarks of Alpheus Doge, special advisor to the Wizengamot, and long-standing friend of Albus Dumbledore's that Skeeter's book contains less facts than a chocolate frog card. Than a chocolate frog card. Sque Skeeter throws back her head and laughs. Darling Dodgy, I remember interviewing him a few years back about mer people rights, bless him. Completely gaga. Seemed to think that we were sitting at the bottom of Lake Windmere. But Windermere kept telling me to watch my watch out for trout, and yet Alpheus Doge's accusations of inaccuracy have been echoed in many places. Does Skeeter really feel that our that, that four short weeks have been enough to gain a full picture of Dumbledore's long and extraordinary life? Oh, my dear Bean Skeeter, wrapping me affectionately across the the knuckles. You know as well as I do how much information can be generated by a fat bag of galleons, a refusal to hear the word no, and a nice sharp quick quote squill. People were queuing to dish the dirt on Dumbledore anyway. Not everyone thought he was so wonderful, you know. He trod on an awful lot of important toes. But old dodgy doge, can get off his high hippogriff because I've had access to a source most journalists would swap their wands for, one who has never spoken in public before, and who was close to Dumbledore during most during the most turbulent and disturbing phase of his youth. 
The advanced publicity for Skeeter's biography has certainly suggested that there will be sh that there will be shocks in store for those who believe Dumbledore to have led a blameless life. What were the biggest surprises she uncovered? I ask. Now come off it, Betty. I'm not giving away all the highlights before anybody's bought the book. Laughed Skeeter. But I can promise that anybody who still thinks Dumbledore was white as his beard is in for a rude awakening. Let's just say that nobody hearing him rage against you know who would have dreamed that he dabbled in the dark arts himself in his youth. And for a wizard who spent his later years pleading for tolerance, he wasn't exactly broad-minded when he was younger. Yes, Albus Dumbledore had an extremely murky past, not to mention that very fishy family which he worked so hard to keep hushed up. I ask whether Skeeter is referring to Dumbledore's brother Aberforth, whose conviction by the Wizengamot for misuse of magic caused a minor scandal 15 years ago. Oh, Aberforth is just the tip of the dung heap, laughs Skeeter. No, no, I'm talking about much worse than a brother with a fondness for fiddling about with goats. Worse even... And the muggle maiming father, Dumbledore couldn't keep either of them quiet. Anyway, they were both charged by the Wizengamot. No, it's the mother and sister that intrigued me, and the little digging uncovered a positive ness of nastiness. But as I say, you'll have to wait for chapters 9 to 12 for the full details. All I can say now is, it's no wonder Dumbledore never talked about how his nose got broken. Family skeletons, notwithstanding, does Skeeter deny the brilliance that led to Dumbledore's many magical discoveries. He had brains, she concedes, although many now question whether he could really take full credit for all his supposed achievements, as I reveal in Chapter 16. Ivor Dillonsby claims he had already discovered eight uses of dragon's blood when Dumbledore borrowed his papers. But the importance of some of Dumbledore's achievements cannot, I venture, be denied. What of his famous defeat of Grindelwald? Oh no, I'm glad you mentioned Grindelwald, says Skeeter, with a tantalising smile. I'm afraid those who go dewy-eyed over Dumbledore's spectacular victory must brace themselves for a bombshell, or perhaps a dung bomb. Very dirty business indeed. All I'll say is, don't be so sure that there were really that there really was a spectacular jewel of legend. After they've read my book, people may be forced to conclude that Grindelwald simply conjured a white handkerchief from the end of his wand, and came quietly. Skeeter refuses to give any more away on this intriguing subject, so we turn instead to the relationship that will undoubtedly fascinate our readers more than any other. Oh yes, says Skeeter, nodding briskly. I devote an entire chapter to the whole Potter-Dumbledore relationship. It's being called unhealthy, even sinister. Again, your readers will have to buy the, your, will have to buy my book for the whole story, but there is no question that Dumbledore took an unnatural interest in Potter from the word, from the word go. Whether that was really in the boy's best interest, well, we'll see. It's certainly an open secret that Potter has had a most troubled adolescence. I ask whether Skeeter is still in touch with Harry Potter whom she so famously interviewed last year, a breakthrough piece in which Potter spoke exclusively of his conviction that you-know-who had returned. 
Oh yes, we've developed a close bond, says Skeeter. Poor Potter has few real friends, and we've met at one of the most testing moments of his life, the Triwizard Tournament. I am probably one of the only people alive who can say that they knew the real Harry Potter. With leads, which leads us neatly to the many rumours still circulating about Dumbledore's final hours. Does Skeeter believe that Potter was there when Dumbledore died? Well, I don't want to say too much. It's all in the book, but eyewitnesses inside Hogwarts Castle saw Potter running away from the scene moments after Dumbledore fell. Jumptor was pushed. Potter later gave evidence against Severus Snape, a man against whom he has a notorious grudge. Is everything as it seems? That is for the wizarding community to decide, once they've read my book. On that intriguing note, I take my leave. There can be no doubt that Skeeter has quilled an instant bestseller, Dumbledore's legions of admirers, meanwhile, may well be trembling at what is on, what is soon to emerge about their best, uh, about their hero. Harry reached the bottom of the article, but continued to stare blankly at the page. Revulsion and fury rose in him like vomit. He balled up the newspaper and threw it with all his force at the wall, where it joined the rest of the rubbish heaped around his overflowing bin. He began to stride blindly around the room, opening empty drawers and picking up books only to replace them on the same piles, barely conscious of what he was doing, as random phrases from Rita's article echoed in his head. An entire chapter to the whole Potter Dumbledore relationship. It's been called unhealthy, even sinister. He dabbled in the dark arts himself in his youth. I've had access to a source most journalists would swap their wands for. Lies, Harry bellowed. And through the window he saw the next door neighbour, who had paused to restart his lawnmower, look up nervously. Harry sat down hard on the bed. The broken bit of mirror danced away from him. He picked it up and turned it over in his fingers thinking, thinking of Dumbledore and the lies with which Rita Skeeter was defaming him. A flash of the brightest blue, Harry froze, his cut finger slipping on the jagged edge of the mirror again. He had imagined it. He must have done. He glanced over his shoulder, but the wall was a sickly peach colour of Arpertunia's choosing. There was nothing blue there for the mirror to reflect. He peered into the mirror fragment again and saw nothing but his own bright green eye looking back at him. He had imagined it. He was There was no other explanation, imagined it, because he had been thinking of his dead headmaster. If anything was certain, it was that the bright blue eyes of Albus Dumbledore would never pierce him again. And that was chapter two of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Next time, chapter three, the Dursleys departing. Until then, bye.